Thank you, Hayden. You, you forgot to mention how humble I am, too. <laughs> That's quite an introduction. Anyway, I'm going to uh, start with a, a, a short story followed by a couple of poems that really serve in a, as an epilogue to it. And uh, the, wet, the, the story comes out of my memoir. The Wedding, Old Westbury, New York, 1957. They were standing by the bar. My father slurred as he argued with his youngest brother, my Uncle Richard, telling him that they should go outside and settle it. Uncle Richard said, don't be ridiculous, you're drunk. When he glanced down and saw me watching them, he told Dad, and stop making a fool out of yourself in front of your son. That made Dad even more furious, and I thought they were going to mix it up right then. Uncle Richard turned around and walked away, laughing and shaking his head as Dad's face got redder and redder. I had no idea who or what started it, but I didn't want to be near either of them. I took a detour before going back to our table where my grandparents were so I could be by myself for a while. I hung around where the band played, watching people dance and having fun. Seeing a forgotten glass half full of beer on a tray, I lifted it and took a couple of sips, then gulped down the rest before anyone saw me. Just like they do in the movies, I swiped the back of my wrist across my mouth. That's when I saw the little kid giving me the once-over. He had a crew cut and blonde hair so light, for a second I thought he was bald. He fidgeted with his dumb-looking plaid bow tie and pointed to the empty glass that I had put back on the tray. Was that good? None of your beeswax. What's your name? I'm Jack. Billy, I said, turning my back to him. How old are you? None of your beeswax. I'm five, and I know how old you are. Yeah, sure. How old am I? You're not old enough to drink beer, and I'm telling. Wait a sec. I held on to the kid's arm to keep him from scampering away and tapping on me. So how old are you? I'm nine, okay? I turned my attention to the dance floor, the band playing, jolly music, and everybody dancing. Everything was loud. You had to almost yell to make yourself heard. The swirling of dresses, the sashaying back and forth, and the laughing was like school recess for the grown-ups, as if they had just got permission to be noisy and wild. The kid tugged my sleeve, asked me, and what's with the eyes? What? Are you squinting or what? It's because I'm half Japanese. That's nice, said Jack, but what's with the eyes? I was about to explain it to him when a girl, at least a head taller than me, came up to us, tossing her long brown hair behind her, so it hung midway down her back. She sipped a Coke straight from the bottle. Is Francis bothering you, she asked. Francis? He told me his name was Jack. I looked at him and he shrugged. I like Jack better, he said. Who wants to be called Francis? That's my brother for you, the girl said. Is he being a pest? Sort of, I said. Then the poor little twerp bent his head, ruefully staring at the floor. I knew that feeling. He's not bothering me. He's okay. The girl said her name was Georgette, and it was the et part, which she just couldn't stand. So she told me to call her George. Both Francis and I think our parents were drunk when they named us, she said, tussling the top of Jack Francis's hair. George wore, wore a lavender dress which made her pale blue eyes even more painfully beautiful. I could barely look at her. But she talked at Blue Street too, which made things easier. George was 12, went to an all-girls school somewhere I never heard of, and she just loved a bunch of things. Ballet lessons, tennis, reading, and R&B music, whatever that was. And today she was stuck looking after her kid brother while her parents had fun at the wedding. So what's your story, she said. It seemed like a trick question. I couldn't answer right off the cuff like that. I didn't want to ruin what was one of the best conversations I had ever had by saying something stupid. So I told her the truth. I'd like to go fishing. Hmm, George said, taking a swig from her coat. That's really interesting, Jack Francis smirked. 
Don't be smart, said George, poking her finger into her brother's chest. Well, maybe it sounds boring, but it is a sport, I said. Yeah, my claiming's a sport, said Jack Francis, dodging another poke from his sister. There's fishing and then there's fishing. Daddy caught a blue marlin off Grand Bahama that was ten feet long and a thousand pounds, George said, tapping a foot to the band's beat. Yes, there's fishing and there's fishing, I agreed, leaving it at that rather than bringing up my biggest catch, the Leviathan out of the Passaic River, the 15-inch brown trout that weighed two pounds or so. We stood watching the action on the dance floor. Everyone was dressed up, couples sometimes dancing slow and sometimes fast. Then they got into a long line, single file, turning their bodies this way and that. George yelled, Conga! and grabbed Francis and me by the wrist, linking us to the line of people that coiled and uncoiled, each alternately holding on to somebody and then raising their arms way over their heads and being rowdy, but in a good way. I held on to a fat lady's waist while I felt George's slender fingers on my shoulders. Then we'd all let go at the same time, point to the ceiling and yell, Conga! I didn't know what I was doing, shuffling my feet and stumbling, stumbling occasionally, but I'd have to say it was just the best time ever, and I never wanted it to end. When all the shouting was over and the band started playing slow music, we moved off the dance floor. George saw someone raving to her. That's mommy, back to the salt mine, she said, her brother in tow. It was fun meeting you, whatever your name is. His name's Billy, and he's been drinking beer, said Francis. George made a funny face, scrunched up her nose, then laughed and disappeared beyond the far side of the dance floor. When I got back to our table, Grandma said, You're just in time. They're about ready to cut the wedding cake. Look at your Uncle Don and Audrey. They look perfect together. From now on, don't forget, you'll be calling her Aunt Audrey. Isn't that nice? Yes, indeedy, I said. Grandma gave me a funny look. The beer was putting weird words in my mouth. <laughs> Grandpa was smoking and talking to Aunt Emily, his sister. She sat next to her son, Dave, and his wife, Joan, who were something like cousins, but not exactly. We were related to them through my great uncle, Ed, now dead, who had given me five dollars the first and only time I met him. Each Christmas, Dave and Joan had sent me a shirt with a tiny alligator printed on it. The first Christmas I received such a shirt, Grandma told me I should appreciate it more than I appeared to. She pointed to the fancy gift box from Saks Fifth Avenue, and I got that it cost a lot. In the Christmases to come, I'd make sure to hold the shirt in midair and admire it before tossing it back in the box. Dad and Richard sat at different ends of the wedding party's table. Uncle Richard chattered with the bridesmaids while Dad sat at the other end drinking and scowling. I was relieved they weren't fighting. When the cake came, I couldn't eat any feeling a little sick to my stomach. I left our table and walked around looking for George and Jack Francis to say goodbye, but I couldn't find them. Soon the band stopped playing, waiters cleared the tables, and men helped ladies on with their coats as all the party magic leaked out of the room. My grandparents and I walked out with Dave and Joan, and when we got out to the street, Dad and Uncle Richard were at it again. Dad pointed to the curb and said he was going to stuff his brother's head into the storm gutter, which Uncle Richard thought was just hilarious. Grandpa told them to knock it off, and Dave told Uncle Richard to stop egging Dad on. It was a long and silent ride home, except for the wind blowing on me in the back seat. Dad's window was wide open, his head hanging out the side the whole way back to New Jersey. Grandma sat in front next to Grandpa, saying that the army changed Dad and ruined his future. This was a familiar theme that I'd hear every now and again. Sometimes she'd say it apropos of nothing and more to herself than me, not even looking up as she absentmindedly ironed Grandpa's dress shirts or tied it up after dinner. Whenever Grandma blamed the army, I thought that my mother and me were part of the same bundle of bad luck. I took the comment personally, as I did most things, but I kept it myself. I kept it to myself. I didn't want to make a bigger deal about it than it was. 
At times, I'd still see mom out of the corner of my eye, but never the whole of her, like when you're at a railroad crossing watching the passenger cars whiz by and see the faces looking out. If I caught a glimpse of her, I knew it was my imagination, though it didn't make it any less real to me. While my grandparents murmured in the front seat, my father's head still drooped half out the window into the dark like a sick dog. I wondered about George and Jack Francis. I leaned over Grandma's seat and asked her about them. Grandma, do you know who the kids were that I was dancing with in the conga line? A tall girl with long brown hair and a little boy in a funny bow tie. I haven't the foggiest, she said, but you look like you were dancing up a storm. I wondered if I'd ever seen them again. We could have had such a good time together. Two poems, this is epilogue. This one's Sayonara Okasan which is Japanese for mother. It was a time between languages when Japanese words sank in the dusk and the rising sun crowed in English. Instead of goodbye or farewell, she told him to say sayonara, which means this is how it must be. The boy squinted into those twilights, saw his mother adrift on the horizon, lost her at the vanishing point. She sailed back to Yokohama, madness as her compass, and he, the map she ripped apart. He wished her away many times, had no right to mourn her, this demon boy of selfish wishes. He suffered long and learned, no shame was on his hands, though still he feels her breath the feather that never lands, ever drifting behind him. <laughs> Shadow in the Maine Woods, Baxter Wilderness Area, 1958. Dad took this picture of me leaning against a Plymouth wagon, one hand in the pocket of my cowboy jeans, the other fighting the glare of the late day sun as it threw glistening bolts from the lake's whispering ripples. His favorite rebuke snaps out at me. For crying out loud, stand up straight. You look like the weight of the world's on your shoulders. But I was no atlas, and what weighed on me was a void and an emptiness. Since her desertion three years before, my mother became but a shadow, some otherworldly figure in the dusk, a memory that Dad kept deep inside, a topic not to be discussed. I pretended to forget her absence, to forget her as her absence weighed me down. We trolled in vain for pike and bass, always alert for the slap of a beaver's tail or the bellowing call of the bull moose. But, like our own secrets, the lake and forest deprived us of both fish and game. Rain rattling down in chains was our only vestige. Packing our gear before the other storm, the one in our heads, could carry us away. We left our complaints lakeside, stacked them by the fish we couldn't catch and by the deserted beaver's dam. We drove south on a ribbon of macadam to nowhere, green boat in tow. Like clever magicians, the lordly trees kept us silent as our car catapulted past. The endless forest held fast to its own deep green secrets. The secret about the shadow would stay well kept by a father and his ten-year-old son, the boy who carried the weight of the world upon his shoulders. Thank you.